Good day, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Evaluation, the Secret Sauce in Your ATE Proposal. I'm your host for today's webinar, Mike Lasecki. And let me tell you a little bit about our format today. It's a little bit different. We're going to have the webinar presentation itself for the first hour of the webinar. And then in a unique format, we're going to open up the webinar to questions from you and invite three expert panelists, including our colleague Tom Higgins from the National Science Foundation, Osa Brand from the Mentor Connect Group, and Lori Wingrate from Evaluate to answer your questions. Those questions can come from the webinar or from uh, anywhere as you're getting ready to prepare your proposal and your evaluation section for the upcoming ATE submission. So let's tell you more about that format as we go forward. Let's get started in today's event and remind you that the webinar is being recorded and you'll automatically get a link to that recording. This webinar is hosted by ATE Central. ATE Central is the resource hub for the ATE program. Thanks to them for hosting this webinar. You can see more about ATE Central and their services at atecentral.net. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate. Evaluate is the evaluation hub for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. That's the ATE program. Evaluate serves the ATE community and others by holding webinars like this one, by disseminating data about the ATE program, by curating a resource lot, excuse me, curating a resource library, and hosting a blog about STEM education and other related topics. So lots of information there. You can find out more about the Evaluate Center and their resources at evaluate.org. You can see their, uh, their URL at the bottom of the slide. Today, everyone says, can I get copies of these slides? Well, the answer is yes. In fact, you can get them right now. I'm not saying you should necessarily do it right now, but on the right-hand side of your screen, there is the web links, the materials you can browse to them at any point. They include an evaluation planning checklist and other resources. And in about 48 hours after the conclusion of today's event, we'll post the recording as well. So all of those things will be available there for you to work to, uh, to access to review again. Let's do some introductions. Again, I'm Mike Lasecki. I work at Luca Partners, and I'm very pleased to be part of the Evaluate team, which brings these webinars to you. I'm the moderator for today. You'll, you'll hear more from me. Also from Evaluate is Lisa Wilson Betcho. Thanks, Lisa, for joining and being our one of our key presenters today. Would you come on and say hello to everybody? Hello, this is Lissa. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, Lissa. Your audio level sounds good. Also joining us today is Emma, Emma Lieberg. Emma, thanks for joining. Come on, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. This is Emma. Glad to have you all on board with us. Good. Sounds good. Uh, Emma, thanks very much. Your audio, lo audio level sounds good. And as I mentioned, although they're not shown on this screen, our panelists joining us for the latter part of the webinar will be Lori Wingate from Evaluate, Thomas Higgins, Program Officer at the National Science Foundation, and Osa Brand from the Mentor Connect Group. So thanks, everyone. We're almost done with our acknowledgments, but it's important to know that working behind the scenes to bring this webinar to you are Lori Wingate and Kelly Robertson from the Evaluate Center. Marilyn Barger is associated with the FLATE ATE Center and a member of the Community College Liaison Panel for Evaluate. Thank you, Marilyn, for helping with this. Cynthia Williams from Style Sheets acts to make sure that not only that all of our words that you see on the screen are perfect. And joining me at Luca Partners is Janet Pinhorn. She, she specializes in communications with all of you and Shannon Payne, who is ICT support. Thank you, Shannon. You know, we mentioned that ATE program. Well, the ATE program is the NSF's premier program for technician education, primarily at two-year community colleges. The topic areas that the ATE program addresses 
are all of the technology topics that you might assume. Biotechnology, engineering technology, micro and nanotechnologies, all of those things are addressed by the ATE program. So thank you to the National Science Foundation for having that program that support us at community colleges. And it's a good time to mention that any opinions and findings and conclusions expressed in, by our presenters and panelists today do not necessarily reflect those views of the National Science Foundation. My last little comment is don't forget today, folks, use that chat window on the upper right hand part of your screen. We want to interact with you. We welcome your questions. Let's get started. Emma, I'm turning over the floor to you. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks everyone again for joining us. Uh, so this, uh, we're going to start out with a quick poll, actually, to go ahead and get to know all of you a little bit more. So who's attending? So we have two questions here for you. So the first being, how are you involved in ATE or NSF? Um, and then which best describes your role, current or future? And if you have other options there, go ahead and use the chat box to the right to answer those. We'll just give you a moment. Um, we just like to know who's involved with us today. So it looks like we have a good percentage of you submitting to an ATE proposal. We've got a mix of principal investigators, grant specialists, and evaluators, and a few people joining us in the chat box. So just give you another moment here to answer this. And then just as a reminder, anytime you see this bold uh, border here on the text box, uh, that's just going to be asking you to go ahead and do something. All right, so Mike, we'll go ahead and close those polls and get moving. So the webinar is uh, three sections. Uh, so first we're going to go over the essential elements of ATE proposal evaluation plans and how to put your evaluation plan together. We're going to have several brief questions breaks through the first part to make sure we address all of your questions. Then we'll review the other places in your proposal where evaluation needs to show up, like in your budget and data management plan and other spots. And after we work through the content, we will start our bonus question and answer panel with our guest experts. So as um, these are our resource size, we're going to be covering a lot of information in a short amount of time today in our webinar. So our ATE evaluation plan checklist will help you remember what we reviewed today and apply the concepts to your own proposal. This checklist includes key points on everything we are going to review today and includes links to a lot of additional resources, which I will highlight throughout the webinar. If you'd like, you can download the checklist now by clicking on the link on the right hand side of your screen to access our materials. Also, all resource materials that are mentioned during this webinar are available through our website. So before we dig into this checklist, I'm going to take a brief moment to talk about evaluation. So evaluation, as defined, is the systematic determination of a project's quality and effectiveness. Evaluation, though, will not only help document that the project did what it is supposed to do, but also the project's contribution to improving technician education and the workforce. So the most important thing when it comes to preparing a proposal for the ATE grant is that you have a sound plan and for how that will make co contribution to the improvement of technician education. When you add in a strong evaluation plan, it will give your proposal a competitive edge, increasing the chances that your project will be funded. So evaluation is also very important to NSF. Celeste Carter, the NSF ATE project director states, if you don't evaluate and assess your activities and outcomes, you can't know if the project was successful. It also provides a project team with data to convince others of the success of the project, as well as contributing to the body of knowledge in that particular area of STEM. So note the first sentence here. If you don't use evaluation, you can't know if the project was successful. So now that we have a similar understanding of evaluation, let's look at the essential elements to include in your evaluation plan for your ATE proposal. So nearly all types of NSF proposals are limited to 15 pages. These little page thumbnails you see on your screen are images from Evaluate's most recent funded proposal. We did What we did for this proposal and what we recommend for all ATE proposals is dedicate one to two pages for evaluation. So here are those two pages I outlined and highlighted is our evaluation plan. So I'm actually going to walk through a few pages here where I'm going to highlight the different elements and where they're required, and then we're going to go into specific details of each. So first you want to identify who is going to evaluate your project. 
Then you want to identify the evaluation questions. Then you're going to need to describe how you will collect the data to address those evaluation questions and explain how you will make sense of those data through analysis and interpretation. And then you'll need to note how the information from the evaluation is going to be communicated and how the project will use that information. The final piece you need to add is that you need to convey a timeline for the evaluation. So for Evaluate's proposal, we actually include this in our project timeline as shown here. So now that you have an overview of the five essential elements, we're going to look into each in a little bit more detail. So first off, the evaluator. NSF likes to see a specific evaluator who has committed to working on your project named in the proposal. If you are unable to identify your evaluator in your proposal, state why you cannot select an evaluator and your plan for finding an evaluator when the grant is funded. Then briefly describe the evaluator's qualifications and how those qualifications match with the evaluation plan for your project. For example, if you have a highly quantitative evaluation plan, the evaluator needs to show that they have experience in quantitative evaluation. Then refer to the evaluator's biosketch and letters of collaboration, which should be uploaded with the proposal as supplementary documents. The biosketch should make the case the evaluator is well matched to the project and not just that the evaluator has experience. So first of all, evaluators are professionals whose job it is is to navigate a project's quality and impact based on evidence. There isn't a specific degree or certification that allows a person to work as an evaluator, so it's incumbent on the client to pick an evaluator that has experience, that matches the needs of the evaluation plan and the project team. So here are some examples to look at for when you're selecting an evaluator for your ATE project. So first off, we're looking for people experienced in evaluating STEM education projects. They all should have a strong research and evaluation skills. They should have strong communication skills and a service orientation. And finally, a good understanding of NSF and two-year college context. The AT program solicitation states that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project must be select requested. So what counts as independent? So we have our project and someone working on the project, like a PI or co-PI, project manager, or even a participating faculty member, would not be considered independent. So the project then sits in a department, and the same goes for someone outside of the project who works in the same department. There is not enough independence here. So the department then sits in the college, and according to the ATE program solicitation, the evaluator may be employed by the project's home institution as long as in, it is in a separate unit, like a different academic department or an institutional resource office. And then outside of the college is the rest of the world. So an evaluator out here has the highest level of independence. So unless a person has a project role, and then the evaluator would not be qualified. So that's now, um, sorry. So now that we know what counts as independence, how do we get, locate qualified independent evaluators. So as evaluators, we like to ask the data. So we asked ATEPIs how they identified their current ATE evaluators on the 2019 annual ATE survey. So here is what 236 current ATEPIs said. So 66% either asked a colleague for a recommendation or selected someone that they had worked with before. 15% used a grants office to select their external evaluator. 9% issued a request for quotes or proposals. Another 9% described other, so the answers varied here, but some examples would be someone else made the selection or met the evaluator at a conference or a meeting. And then less than 1% used the, an evaluator directory. But the big key takeaway here is that over 165 current ATE PIs used colleagues or grants offices to identify their external evaluator. So keep this in mind when you are looking for yours. So just a quick overview, there are three things you need to do in your proposal when it comes to identifying your evaluator. You need to identify them by name, describe their qualifications, and refer to their biosketch and commitment letter. 
So keep those things in mind because we are going to present you with three examples of evaluator descriptions and I'm going to ask you which one is best using the chat box. So here they are. I'm going to give you a few moments to read these through and then go ahead and use the chat box to your right to respond. All right, so a bunch of people are responding. Yeah, so it looks like Proposal A is kind of winning the game here. Um, so yeah, A is a really good description. And it hits on all the points we discussed. Um, so I'm actually just going to walk through B and C. Feel free to go ahead and continue putting them in here. Um, so B, it's not really clear on who's going to be doing the evaluation or whether the center actually committed to the work for the project. And then Proposal C may be okay, but it's not evident the person has experience leading external evaluations. And if the person is qualified, then they should make sure to make that clear in the description. So thank you all that those all who have participated in that. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue on here. Um, so to help you with that task of finding and selecting an evaluator, Evaluate has created a guide. Um, it is available on our website, and it walks you through the process of identifying um, an evaluator for your project and answering some common questions that we get around this topic. As I mentioned earlier, the proposal should include the evaluator's bio sketch in NSF format, and we have created a template for you to uh, either use them as evaluator or to go ahead and give to your evaluator, um, and that's also on our site as well. So now I'm going to turn things over to Mike uh, for questions on this section. So, Mike. Thank you, Emma. Emma, you mentioned that you might not be able to name an evaluator in the proposal, although uh, the NSF would like you to identify an evaluator. What would prevent you from naming an evaluator? Yeah, Mike, that's a great question. So what we've been hearing uh, is on the procurement side, some institutions are requesting that um, you cannot put an evalu a name an evaluator in your proposal. So it's coming from the institution side. So if you do run into this, um, what NSF recommends is identifying, um, is stating that you're not able to identify that person and then also identifying that plan for how you plan on identifying them and selecting them once your grant is funded. Okay, good. Thanks for that clarification. One of the, uh, one of the other questions that we had said, should you consider naming someone on your project team to essentially be assigned to work with that evaluator? Let's call them an internal evaluator on the project team. Is that common? Do you do that? Um, Mike, I think that's a really great uh, question you brought up. And we certainly do that here on Evaluate's grant. And I think it, it is a good recommendation to kind of have a point person on your project team um, that kind of keeps an eye on the evaluation and does most of the uh, communication with your external evaluator. It just keeps sure that making sure that communication moves. Um, we do have a resource uh, about evaluation communication on our website that we can certainly add to the materials list um, that kind of walks through some of those communication pieces and management. Excellent, uh, Emma, thanks. I'll mention that in the chat window, several people have made comments about that procurement question. It does vary, as you, as you mentioned, from college to college, so that's an important thing. Emma, there was a question, one other one, before we move forward, and it was, you showed in your, in your two-page evaluation section, you showed what looked like a logic model in there. It doesn't necessarily have to be there, but I think there's a section coming up on logic models, so we're going to probably hold off on that question until we get there, if that's all right. Yes, and I was, I was just about to say, we, we will be covering that in Lissa's next section, talking about logic models and where we can place those throughout your proposal. Okay. You know, Emma, just perfect timing. We're, we're right on time. Let's go ahead and transition to Lissa for that next session. Lissa, I just clicked forward. There you are. Go ahead, Lissa. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Emma. So on to um, the next section in an evaluation plan, which is evaluation questions. So these questions really serve as the foundation for your evaluation. So it's important to consider them carefully. 
So in this section, you want to make sure that you list the key questions that the evaluation will address. These are overarching questions about the project's quality, impact, or effectiveness that the evaluation will answer based on evidence. So we're talking like three or seven questions, not something like 20 or 30. The question should be about the big picture, not about specific counts or measures. You want to be sure to include questions about both project implementation and outcomes. And of course, it's important that the evaluation is clearly aligned with the project's goals and activities. So what makes a good evaluation question? Well, evaluation questions should first of all be evaluative. I know this sounds redundant, but a non-evaluative question might ask something like, how many students did the project serve? So this question is asking about just a single data point. So if the answer to this question was, for example, the project served 100 students, could we determine if that was good or bad? Not necessarily based on just this question. Therefore, this question is not inherently evaluative. So if we rephrase this question to ask, what was the project's impact on program enrollment? We could determine whether the program enrollment increased, decreased, or remained the same since the project was implemented. This type of, this type of answer is more meaningful and more evaluative than just saying that the project served 100 students. Second, a good evaluation question should be reasonable. So by this, we mean that the questions are linked to what the program can practically and reasonably achieve or influence. For example, asking whether the project increased manufacturing employment in the entire state may be an unreasonable expectation of the project given time and resources. We want to avoid evaluation questions that are outside the scope or resources of a project. Instead, we might ask, to what extent did students served by the project find employment in manufacturing sector? This question is more suitable to the expectations of the project. Third, good evaluation questions should be specific. So questions should clearly identify what will be investigated in the evaluation. For example, if an evaluation question asks, did the project increase, ev increase instructor effectiveness? We're left asking, what is instructor effectiveness and how is it really defined? So we don't want vague questions that are, that are stated in overly broad terms. This really introduces unnecessary confusion into your evaluation. Instead, we could be more specific and ask, to what extent did participating instructors increase their knowledge about nanotechnology? So this question clearly states the expectations of the project outcomes. Fourth, good evaluation questions should be answerable. So by this, we mean that the question should be able to be answered given access to the data and resource constraints. So if we ask, for example, to what extent does the project affect long-term persistence in STEM careers, this would require long-term tracking and follow-up with students over years, potentially decades. So this would not be feasible given, say, a three-year ATE grant. Instead, we could focus on a more short-term outcome such as to what extent does the project affect students' interest in pursuing a future career in STEM? So this is much more feasible to answer this evaluation question with the constraints of an average ATE grant. And finally, when considering your whole set of evaluation questions, you want to make sure that they are complete in thoroughly addressing the purpose of the evaluation and evaluation users' information needs. So all aspects of project activities and intended outcomes should be addressed in your evaluation questions. Mapping evaluation questions to a logic model can be a great way to help ensure completeness in your evaluation questions. So I know it came up earlier, but if you're not familiar with a logic model, they're a way of visually communicating a project's activities and outcomes. So logic models aren't required for the ATE program, but they're a great way to show the overall design of a project, and they can be really useful for evaluation planning. So here on the slide, you see a number of thumbnail images of various logic models from ATE and from other STEM education projects. So let's take a quick look at a general project logic model. So you can see here that I've grayed out some of the details in the boxes just so we can focus on how the overall structure of a logic model can help frame your evaluation questions. So you can see across the top, this logic model identifies the project activities, so what a project does, creates, or what it delivers, and then the short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcomes. So these are the changes that the project intends to bring about through its original activities. So if we ask evaluation questions about the activities in that first column, it really helps to determine whether 
the project is achieving their targets in terms of measures. This could be things such as student numbers, diversity, or even satisfaction. It's also really important to ask questions about the project's strengths and weaknesses to make sure that the evaluation is gathering information that can be used by the project to enhance its quality. The evaluation should also ask about short-term outcomes. So what changes do you expect to see after the activities are carried out? And then what, what, are, what are the expected consequences of those changes that we saw in the short-term outcomes? So asking about short-term and mid-term outcomes can really make a larger argument about the effectiveness of your project rather than simply asking questions about the activity counts or satisfaction. It can often be difficult to ask about the long-term outcomes of a project. So there, these might have, these might be intended consequences that are maybe 10 years down the road. There might be a much longer timeline than your actual evaluation. Therefore, you might not always ask evaluation questions about the long-term outcomes. But if we look at the questions that we have you know, laid out here, our pretend questions, you can see that the evaluation questions span most columns of our logic model. So asking questions about both implementation and outcomes. So in your evaluation, you want to make the strongest argument you can about the effectiveness of your project. So consider what types of information would convince you as a scientist whether the project has been successful or not. So I know we covered this pretty fast, but Evaluate has a number of resources on logic models and evaluation questions to help you really put this into practice. So if you want to create a logic model for your ATE project, check out our logic model template for ATE projects, which includes question prompts and examples. If you want to learn more about how to integrate logic models into your funding proposal, check out the recordings, slides, and handouts from a webinar from a couple years ago on that very topic. And finally, for more information about what makes, a good, what makes good evaluation questions, see the evaluation question checklist. So this checklist provides more detail and definition on the criteria of good evaluation questions that we discussed earlier. All right, so the next element of an evaluation plan is about the data for the evaluation. So this is what information will be used, how it will be collected, analyzed, and interpreted. So these are all distinct things, but we've kind of lumped them together because we can't talk about one without referring to the others. So in this section of your evaluation plan, you need to make sure to describe what information will be used to answer the evaluation question. So these are your indicators. You want to describe how the information will be obtained and from what resource, from what sources. These are the data collection methods. How the quantitative and qualitative data will be summarized. So that's the analysis. And how the findings will be used to answer the evaluation questions. So that's the interpretation part. So that was a lot. So let's pull all of these terms together. So indicators are specific things that you will me measure so that you can answer the evaluation questions. Examples might be the number of educators served, students' interest in STEM, or rates of program completion. Data collection is how the information for the evaluation will be obtained. So data collection methods could include surveys, interviews, focus groups, or it could be using existing student or program data. Analysis is the process of transforming that raw data into usable information. So this might include identifying themes in qualitative data, or producing descriptive statistics like means or percentages, or even doing some, statistic, some significance testing. So note that analysis is not quite the same thing as interpretation, although they're often conflated. So interpretation is what you do so you can actually answer the evaluation questions. So you can see here in the picture, this little guy with the measuring tape has measured the height of water in this glass in inches. But now he needs to interpret this finding to determine if the glass is half full or if it's half empty. Interpretation is really how you reach conclusions to your evaluation questions. So now you may be thinking that this is a lot of information to include in just one to two pages of your evaluation plan. And you're right. You probably won't have a lot of room to go really far in depth with all of this. But you want to make sure that there is a concrete plan for collecting and using the evaluation data. So with that in mind, take a moment to read the snippet of an evaluation plan and use the chat box to share your opinion on how well it describes the plan for obtaining and using data in this evaluation. 
So again, look at the description, read the, the description of an evaluation plan, and let us know what you think. Yeah, so I see Kathy wrote that it's kind of vague. Jenna says, yuck. Blake says, too generic. Megan says, terrible lack of detail. No matrix. That's funny. That's what we're going to be talking about. Pretty weak. Ooh, buzzwords. Yeah, Susan, I completely agree. Deborah says, it's really boilerplate language. And Jennifer points out that it really needs more specifics, right? So like in this, there's a lot of good words. There's a lot of fluff words. Someone said buzzwords. I like that too. But it doesn't actually provide any specifics. It's really generic. It's a vague description of an evaluation. So it's good you guys are all picking up on this. This is not what you want to include in your proposal. You want to be more specific about things. So one way of doing that, well, an efficient way to present the data elements of an evaluation plan is to put them into a table like this. I like to say that tables and matrices are an evaluator's best friend. So don't worry about reading the contents of this table right now, but instead focus on the overall format and organization of the structure. So here you can see on the top, we have our evaluation questions, and then we have the indicators to answer the evaluation questions, the data sources and methods for each indicator, how we're going to analyze those data once we have them, and then how we're going to interpret each indicator. So as you might imagine, using this format really forces you to think carefully about the data you're collecting, how you're going to collect it, and then once you have it, how you're going to use it. So using a matrix format like this can really help to strengthen your evaluation plan and show the logical connections between your indicators, data sources, analysis, and interpretation. So if you want to put your data collection plan into a table like this, we do have some guidance for you in our evaluation data matrix template. So it includes definitions and examples for each component to help you along the way. So we're going to pause right here to answer some questions before we move on to evaluation communication, use, and reporting. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you for the questions. Thank you, Alyssa. Well, you got a great response from everyone. They, they didn't like that, uh, that data thing in the chat window, did they? <laughs> No, it's good. So here's the they first question. Yeah. <laughs> right. So here's the first question. Um, you mentioned the challenge of fitting this all into two pages. And you've got that, lo someone pointed out, you have that logic model in the evaluation part. Is it common to put it there, or is it more common to have a logic model elsewhere in the proposal, maybe up in the project plan or the project description? What's your thinking about that? Certainly. So when uh, everyone goes back to review these slides, you can look at the two pages from Evaluate's most recent submission. If you look at it a little closer, the logic model is actually not necessarily in our evaluation section, but it's right before it. And so a logic model can do a really great job of tying the different activities of a project together and of what the intentions and what the intentions of the activities and the outcomes are, and then use it for a basis of the evaluation. So that logic model should be within the 15-page project description. It should not be included as a supplement. OK, good. That's important. That makes sense. Thank you. Here's a question that came in. You know, at community colleges and, of course, any educational institution today, there are restrictions on student data, student information, student identifiers. Is that described here um, in the evaluation section, how you will protect student data? I mean, that's a big question today. Where, where does that come in? I think that is a really important aspect to make sure that you are protecting the identity of people you're collecting data from. So there is another section that um, you could describe that in as well in your data management plan. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in our webinar. Oh, good, good, excellent, thanks. Well, one small question, just a terminology. You know, you might, everyone's not always familiar with these terms, but could you distinguish the distinction between a program officer, a grants officer, a sponsored research officer? We're, we're not 100% certain of the terminology here. Yes, I think between the community college uh, and as well as NSF, there's a lot of um, 
different uses being thrown around. So generally a program officer, we're referring to your program officer at NSF. So that is the person that manages and reviews um, your grant proposal submissions and everything like that. And then a grant specialist tends to be someone that is internal to your college that helps prepare and apply for grants. Does that clarify it, Mike? Yes. Um, is that the same, one, one follow-up question, is that the same as a sponsored research officer, one of our colleagues, yes? I have to admit, I have not heard the term sponsored research officer. So maybe that's something that can come back up later during our question and answer panel, and okay. one of our additional experts can chime in. OK, perfect. Here's the final question for this section. Our timing is really good for today. But this one's a little complicated question, Lissa. So the evaluation questions, are they tied to the goals, to the objectives, to the outcomes? How is that? Um, what's the tie? That's, I'm not sure I'm describing the question very well, but if you're writing the evaluation questions, do you look at the goals? Do you look at the outcomes? Where, where do you focus your attention? <laughs> That's a great question. I think the short answer is that you look at all of those things, but I think it's really important to determine what will be most useful to the stakeholders involved. So asking the project staff, what are they really hoping to show with their evaluation data? And if it's something that they're really interested in using evaluation data for internal purposes in order to improve their activities, to offer things um, better, you know, maybe even looking at audience reach and audience scope could be something. Um, sure. Or maybe they really want to focus on the outcomes. They really want to show the effectiveness of their project. So we recommend doing a bit of both because generally people want both. Um, but I think you want to make sure that you're not just tied to the specific goals, right? So you don't want your evaluation questions to just confirm, yes, they did the activities, they served the people that they said that they would in their proposal. You want to make sure that you also look at outcomes, so what happened because of those activities. But you also don't want to get stuck in just what was written up in the proposal because maybe there are unintended consequences or um, unintended benefits as well that the sure. evaluation could also enlighten. Well, that's a perfect answer, Alyssa. Thank you very much. So much fun putting you on the spot and seeing how you do with these questions. You do really well. Uh, let's go ahead. We're, we're good for timing. I just uh, click forward at the slide. Emma, why don't you come back and talk, talk to us about communication and use? Great. Thanks, Mike. So in the sec next section of your evaluation plan, you need to touch on communication and use of information from the evaluation. Uh, so we're going to briefly cover that in this next section. So here, you should identify what reports will be prepared and who will receive them. At the minimum, you should have one annual evaluation report in advance of your annual report due date to NSF to ensure you can use your evaluation findings. It's a good idea to mention how frequently the evaluator will communicate with the project team to show that there is a real feedback loop. For the evaluate team, we meet with our evaluator once per month. And then you also want to note how evaluation results will be shared with the external audience who could benefit from the information. So these checkpoints are embedded in NSF's review criteria, as you can see here. Is the evaluation likely to provide useful information to the project and others? And will the project evaluation inform others through communication of results? So make sure to demonstrate these uh, in your proposal. So that was a real quick section, so we're just going to do a quick recap for you. So formal reporting should occur at least annually. And the project team should engage with the evaluator regularly and evaluate recommends monthly. And projects need to show commitment to using the evaluation results for improvement. So we're going to do a quick chat. Uh, so I just ran over those really quick, but I'd like you to read through these descriptions of evaluation, communication, and use from three different proposals and decide which one you think is best. And then we're going to use the chat feature again to go over our answers. So I'll just give you a moment to read through these, and then let's go ahead and use the chat box.
great. So we seem to be getting pretty synonymous answers here. I have not seen anyone put anything other than B. So I'm going to walk through uh, A, B, and C here real quick just to give you our opinion of these. So proposal A, uh, really no substantive information here. It doesn't show any awareness that the project should be the project should be receiving and using the information from the evaluation on a regular basis. B is the clear winner. Um, so proposal B indicates commitment to actually using the information and sharing it out with others. And then proposal C, the evaluation seems to be treated strictly as accountability function and really doesn't demonstrate the commitment to using what's learned from the evaluation. So we would recommend the best uh, of these three would be proposal B. So thank you so much for participating in our fun chat box there. So we also want to talk about timeline. So this is the last piece I'm going to go over. It's a really pretty simple idea here. We wanted to just identify um, the key evaluation activities that will take place and then show that there is a concrete plan for getting timely information from the evaluation. So a matrix, as Alyssa mentioned, is our best friend. And it's a great way to show your timeline. So um, you want to go ahead and identify those key activities. And for those, I mean major data collection events. We also want to include reporting. And then your meetings with your evaluator. So those are your actual in-person meetings. You would probably have regular virtual meetings in between those. And you can include the evaluation timeline in the evaluation section. Or you can actually do this within your project overall timeline. And you can see here a screenshot of Evaluate's proposal where we actually included this information right in our project timeline to save on space and also just to have a good timeline of our project all together. So just quick overview of what needs to be included in those evaluation plans. Again, these are the five essential elements. We want to make sure we include our evaluator information, the evaluation questions, we need to include information about data, how it's being to be collected, analyzed, and interpreted, our communication and use plan, and then again, our timeline. All of that really can be put into one to two pages, as we've shown you. There's another resource for you. This is our evaluation plan template. It helps you present the evaluation plan succinctly within your proposal. Um, it shows you how to organize the information efficiently, and we suggest that you use this along with the evaluation plan checklist that we referenced earlier. So we're going to take a quick question break in just a moment, and then Liz is going to show you how to walk, going to walk through how to integrate evaluation throughout your proposal. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to Mike for our next question break if you have any questions on this quick section we just covered. Mike? Thank you, Emma. You know, you've convinced us you can actually do this in one to two pages, but here's a question that came in. Who actually writes this section? You mentioned early on about engaging an evaluator. Is the expectation that the evaluator writes this section? Does the project team write it? How, how does that work? Yeah, that, that's a really great question, Mike, and I can, I can kind of give you my opinion on that and how Evaluate does it, and then we certainly should probably bring this back up to the expert panel as well. Um, but okay. in terms of Evaluate, uh, what we do is actually get the evaluation plan itself from our external evaluator who we um, work with in advance of our proposal being submitted. Um, but then the, as, as the PI and co-PI, we actually take that and kind of work with the evaluator to work on that. So we really recommend that this is a combined effort um, because you want to really make sure, as, a, as Lisa talked about, the evaluation questions, those need to really be about your project. And the PI is the one who has that context, and the evaluator has the evaluation experience. So combining together to kind of co-write this section to make sure it's the best fit for your project um, would be what I would say. I don't know if Lisa has anything to add or we want to hold that um, until the expert panel that's coming up. Lisa, what would you say to that question? Uh, who writes this section? I think Emma had a great answer. We've certainly seen PIs or grant specialists as well who have written evaluation plans themselves. But I will tell you that every external evaluator that I have ever talked to or worked with has said that they would really like to be part of the process, even if you um, have to have the evaluator go out to bid after the grant is, is received. OK, that makes sense. You know, I think what we're going to do, there's another question about the use of supplemental 
space in the proposal. We'll come back to that when we invite uh, Tom Higgins to come on to give us a NSF perspective. Well, let's hold on that question if we could. Uh, let's move forward. I'm going to click forward here on the, on the system and ask you, Lisa, to come back about thinking you know, beyond, beyond this two pages, how do you integrate this back into your proposal? Go ahead. Great. Yes. So up to now, we have really addressed what should go into the section of your proposal titled Evaluation Plan. But there are other areas of the proposal where evaluation needs to show up. So let's take a look at those. All right. <laughs> so there are four other places beyond the evaluation plan section where information related to evaluation should show up. So first is a section called results from prior NSF support, which is relevant only if you've had prior NSF funding. Then there's the budget and budget justification, your data management plan, and then references. So let's go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So if the PI or co-PI on the proposal has received prior funding from NSF related to the current proposal within the past five years, the ATE project description must begin with a section titled results for prior NSF support. So if that applies to you, this is where you would describe your previous project outcomes. So reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work that's related to the current proposal. So this section has to include the headings of intellectual merit and broader impacts. So if you're applying for NSF funding, you should know that intellectual merit and broader impacts are the NSF review criteria and that intellectual merit is about the advancement of knowledge and broader impacts is about the benefits to society. So we do have a one-page checklist to help you prepare your results for prior support section. It includes NSF's requirements as well as our suggestions for this part of your project description. So again, you can access all of this and the other resources we discussed throughout the webinar from the link to the right side of your screen. Even if you don't have results from prior results to report in the proposal that you're submitting for this fall, we do encourage you to review this checklist because it will help you set up your evaluation to produce the kinds of things that will be compelling in this section when you go back for more funding later. So on to the budget and budget justification. So you may recall this quote from earlier about the requirement from, for an independent evaluator. So the rest of the quote is that the requested funds must match the scope of proposed evaluative activities. So you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly does that mean? How much does an evaluation really cost? Well, there's no real prescribed cost for an evaluation. The cost heavily relies on the evaluation scope and the types of data collection methods and activities that will be included throughout the evaluation. We can say that ATE evaluations tend to be between 4 and 10% of a project's total budget. So for smaller projects with smaller evaluations, that percentage might lean towards the lower side. So when it comes to the budget justification, there are a few aspects you want to make sure to include. So according to NSF's Proposal and Award Policies and Procedure Guide, commonly referred to as the PAPPG, there are three main items you'll want to address. So first, the hourly rate of pay whoops, too far, the hourly rate of pay for your evaluator. Second, justify the time required for the evaluation activities. So this should match your timeline and the evaluation activities that are discussed in the evaluation plan section. And finally, outline the evaluator's main tasks and their deliverables. So the important part of all of these items is that they are reasonable and that they're justified. So making sure that these numbers don't just seem like they're pulled from thin air, but they really have reasoning behind them. So all NSF proposals require a data management plan. So this document can be up to two pages, and it must include things like the types of data or other materials that will be generated by the project, the format of that data, policies for accessing and sharing the data, policies for use of the data by others, and plans for archiving and preserving access to the data. So again, this is where we would talk about security issues that were mentioned earlier in the webinar. So the important point here is to make sure that when each of these items refers to data, they're also talking about evaluation data. So make sure to include aspects of your evaluation data in writing up your data management plan. So finally, all proposals should have references, which are separate from the 15-page project description. So including up-to-date and relevant references to evaluation literature in your project description 
can really help to show that the evaluation is grounded in and building on current knowledge and practice. So if you're going to use a specific evaluation approach or instrument, make sure that you provide citations to support its use in your context. So there's no page limit for the reference cited document, but you should only include references that you mention in your project description or that are really pertinent to your work. So this is the final section of your proposal that you want to include information about your evaluation in addition to the evaluation plan section. So before we move on to the question and answer panel that Emma and Mike mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, we do want to introduce some new opportunities from Evaluate. So we are really excited to announce a special opportunity for only those of you who are attending this webinar. So Evaluate is beginning to pilot test one-on-one -on -one coaching, and we want to give you an opportunity to get some feedback on your evaluation plans. So if you're currently writing an ATE proposal and you're interested in receiving feedback about your evaluation plan from an Evaluate team member, follow the link that will throw up in the chat box in a second to apply for some one-on-one -on -one coaching. So this short form, when you click the link, will ask you to describe what you're working on and what type of assistance you're looking for. And then one of our Evaluate team members will contact you about next steps. So remember, this opportunity is only available to those on this webinar. And if you're interested, please make sure you submit your request by September 6th, because we want to make sure that we get back to you with plenty of time before the October 3rd um, ATE submission deadline. So I'm going to pass it to Emma for our next opportunity. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, we're so excited to officially launch. Uh, today is our actual official launch with you on the webinar. Uh, our Evaluate Slack community is officially launching today. Um, and we invite everyone who cares about evaluation to join. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, you can find more details on our website on how to get more information about our community and also how to join um, our new Evaluate community is on the webinar page itself, which you can access through the web links material link there. So again, this is our online community that's launching. So if you have questions about evaluation or just want to get to know some new or uh, current ET evaluators and people interested in evaluation, you can join us. So please do so. Great. Thanks, Emma. So this ends the formal content of our webinar, and we are really excited to offer an additional question and answer panel to ensure that all of your questions regarding proposals and evaluation plans are answered. But if, however, you have to run, we do understand. But please take a couple of minutes to fill out our post-webinar survey. Um, there we go. It just popped up in the chat window. Thank you so much, Anna, for being wonderful on the links throughout the webinar. We all really appreciate it. So these surveys really do help us imp improve future webinar offerings. So please take a minute to fill it out. All right, so we will bring the survey link back up at the end of the Q&A session as well. So on to our Q&A panel. So Emma and I wanted to give you a broader perspective on evaluation plans and ATE pro proposals than just ourselves. Although we'll make sure to stick around for the rest of the time if you have any specific questions aimed at us. But I'm very excited for the guests that we have joining us today. Together, they have a lot of experience and insight into ATE proposals. So I want to give each of them a chance to say hello and do a quick introduction for themselves. Um, but in the meantime, while they're introducing themselves, feel free to start writing any questions you have about creating an evaluation plan or ATE proposals in the chat window. So we'll start with Mike Lezecki, who you've heard throughout this webinar. He will serve as moderator for this section. Mike, you want to just say a quick hi again? Yes, hi everyone. Thanks, uh, Lisa. You know, I have the opportunity to be bo work both as an evaluator as a, and a PI on some ATE proposals, so I have that sort of dual perspective. Thank you. Certainly. We appreciate having you on board. Tom Higgins, can you give us a quick introduction? Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, Hi, my name is Tom Higgins. I'm a rotating program officer here in the Division of Undergraduate Education, which means um, I'm on loan from my home institution, and my home institution is a community college, uh, City Colleges of Chicago. I'm starting my fourth year here at the NSF, um, and I've been working on ATE as well as um, all of our other programs since I got here in 2015. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Osa, can you give us a quick introduction? I can, thank you. 
I started as a college teacher, and I spent about 20 years developing and managing projects for professional associations. Uh, I retired from that world last year, and now I'm working as a private consultant uh, with a primary commitment to an NSF-funded project called Venture Connect, uh, which mentors community college faculty who are developing proposals, and many of them for the first time. Um, while I've been listening to the webinar, it's had me reflecting on how project evaluation has evolved during the years that I have been personally involved in project management. Uh, my projects went from having no evaluation component at all in the beginning to evaluations that just consisted of using checklists to make sure we were on schedule, and then to the kinds of supportive evaluations that, that we've been discussing here. So I feel really fortunate to know firsthand what an impact evaluation can have on project outcomes and to be able to help prospective new PIs appreciate the, the supportive role that a well-qualified external evaluator can have on their projects. Thank you, Otha. It's a great perspective to have. And finally, we have Lori Wingate. You want to jump on and say hi? Sure. Hi, this is Lori. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am Director of Evaluate, and I've been in this role since, I believe, about 2010, and was just thrilled with uh, the wonderful job that Emma and Lissa did on this webinar. Um, so yeah, throw your questions at us. Wonderful. I will pass it over to Mike now. I know we've saved some questions for earlier in the chat. If you feel like you put a question in the chat, but it hasn't come up again, please make sure you put it back in there um, and include all of your other questions. All right, take it away, Mike. Thank you, Alyssa. Tom, I'm going to turn to you first, and it's sort of a general question, but can you give us a perspective from the National Science Foundation's point of view on the value that they find in evaluation? Why, why is it such an important part of the projects today? Just give us your overview there. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, first of all, I would say that evaluation is something that we require for all projects, not just ATE projects. Um, and the, the big answer to your question is that we're charged with using the taxpayer's money. And evaluation is one of the ways that we make sure that the taxpayer's money is used wisely. And um, if we don't have evaluation and assessment of our projects going on, we don't know whether they're um, successful, we don't know whether or not they're good investments, and we don't know whether or not the people that we're investing in is, um, are, are doing what they said they were going to do. So this is really, um, we require this because it's part of our oversight function with res and respect to stewardship of um, the money of, of the people who live in our country. So that's a good perspective. Uh, so, but that means it, NSF has this as a required part of the proposal, right? It's not an optional part. It is not optional, um, and um, I, you know, I, I will say that uh, it's we we expect uh, evaluation plans to be in every proposal that comes in. Um, now, I will say also that uh, not every evaluation plan that comes in is perfect, and some of them aren't even good. Um, but we still fund projects anyway, and um, that's because if all of the other aspects of a project are strong, the uh, PIs like myself will work, or POs like myself will work with PIs to strengthen the evaluation plan and get it up to the point where it is strong enough for us to um, feel like it's a, a worthwhile risk of um, taxpayers' money. So we expect um, principal investigators, the principal investigator, to be a savvy consumer of evaluation. And by that, um, it means that there, it, we expect that person to be committed to using evaluation, to making sure that they're getting a quality product out of the person or persons that they have um, contracted with to be evaluators, and that they're very upfront and honest about um, what is happening and is not happening with projects. You know, we don't expect every project to be successful in the sense that it, it achieves all of its goals, but we expect every project to be successful in the, in the sense that we're learning something new from it. And all of us being scientists, we really can understand that you learn as much, if not more, from the places that you fail or the places that you expect success and it doesn't happen than in the places where success just happens very quickly. 
And so evaluation is a way of, of really um, incorporating the important aspects of the scientific method into a project to make sure that we're hitting the intellectual merits and the broader impacts at a very high level. Intellectual merit, what can we learn? A lot of times what we learn are things that are unanticipated. Um, and, and we learn new things that are unanticipated because we have good PIs who understand the importance of evaluation. They're working with the people who um, are able to provide them the data and the perspective that they need in order to see where a project is going and take advantage of the um, unintended um, and unanticipated uh, opportunities that arise. So, um, you know, th this really just, I think, is really the importance of evaluation is, is partially there also because it really fits with their uh, two merit re review criteria we need. Tom, I like your term, the PI should be a good consumer of evaluation. I think that's an important uh, way of framing it. Tom, I've got a, uh, a question for you that's come up several times in the Q&A here, and has to do with the use of, su of that supplemental docs section of the proposal. What should go in there? What can go in there? What shouldn't go in there? Can you give us some guidance there? Yes, um, and this is something that has um, become much more restrictive in the past few years. Um, so first of all, um, everyone should go to the um, PAPPG and read the section on supplementary documentation that is in there, because that is going to be the definitive guidance of NSF policy with respect to use of supplementary documentation. Um, so even as uh, far back as, as two years ago for ATE, we allowed people to put extra information into the supplementary documentation. And um, that extra information was supposed to be things that, um, that corroborated what was stated in the narrative. We are no longer allowing that. Everything that is important for your project has to go into the 15-page narrative. And what is in the supplementary documentation is really limited. And it's limited to things like, and this is not an exhaustive list, um, but it's limited to things like the biosketch of your evaluator, which could go into the biosketch section. Um, but if it can't go in the biosketch section, can go into the supplementary document section. The uh, data management plan, a postdoctoral mentoring plan, um, letters of commitment that state um, what partners will do in order to make sure your project is, su is successful. And, and that's, that's pretty much um, it right there. It's a very restricted amount. And the reason is because we want to make sure that there is a level playing field. We want to make sure that everybody is, has a fair chance to compete for the funds. And it's not fair for somebody to think that they have to put their two-page um, evaluation section in their 15-page narrative and someone else to think they can put it in their supplementary documentation because that gives somebody two extra pages. And two of 15 is a pretty high percentage, right? Um, sure. So, so really, um, this springs from the idea that we want the competition for federal funds to be fair. And so we've become um, very conservative about what is and is not allowed in um, supplementary documentation. So if you are um, concerned about whether or not something can go into the supplementary documentation, I would say um, try to contact somebody. Um, try to contact the Cognizant Program Officer at NSF. If you cannot contact that person, um, you know, my, my president, uh, had a saying that I love to invoke from time to time, and this is a good time to do it. Um, if uh, if you need an answer today, the answer is no. So <laughs> opt on the conservative side yes. if you can't find somebody to give you a definitive answer. And just remember that because somebody did it last year doesn't mean it's allowed this year. Our thinking on these things evolves constantly. And um, so we're really much more conservative about that than we have been in the past. Some good points there, Tom. Tom, we're going to put you on the side for a moment, come back to you, put you back on the stand in a minute. But let's turn to 
Osa, Osa, I have a question for you. I know you're involved with the Mentor Connect program, which has a large focus on this category of small, new to ATE grants. And many people online today are preparing proposals for that for that particular segment of the solicitation. What would you say from a small, new to ATE perspective? Um, how does evaluation fit in? What should we worry about at that level of project? Well, I think uh, maybe to begin with, I, I should uh, say something about what that program is for the benefit of the people that aren't familiar with it. Uh, it's designed to support technician education projects at community colleges that haven't received NSF funding in the past seven years. Uh, and this is the program that's the main focus of the Mentor Connect project that I'm, that I'm involved in. Uh, so small new to AT projects are generally directed by faculty who don't have any prior experience managing NSF-funded projects, and often they don't have any prior experience managing funded projects at all. Experienced evaluators can really be critical to the success of those projects, whether it's helping the PIs to stay on course or to deal with problems that had them requiring to uh, have them uh, changing the course of the, the project. So I, th I think the answer to your question, Mike, is that expert evaluation impacts the small new to AT projects by providing very valuable guidance that in effect becomes a form of mentoring. Also, do you give them guidance? I mean, for that small new to ATE, right, it's, the, I, as I recall, the maximum request you can make is $300,000. Do you recommend a certain percentage of that go to evaluation? Or what, what advice do you give to someone who's, who's trying to budget for this at that small new to ATE? We generally say that about 7% is what's expected. Um, we have uh, people that uh, go as low as 5% and, and find that NSF accepts that. Uh, but you know, 5 to 7 to 8% is would be the norm. OK, good, excellent. Also, we're going to come back to you with another question. But now let's turn to Lori Wingate. We'll, we'll bring our, our panelists back to the stand in a minute. But Lori, I know you think about evaluation in all kinds of ways, not just that two pages that it appears in the proposal, but, but how it integrates in with the whole project itself. Do you, do you have comments for us? Um, well, I think thinking about it specifically uh, during proposal development, I think thinking about your project design and your plan for implementation um, concurrently with your evaluation plan can really help you tighten up your project plan. Like there have been times when I started, um, you know, thinking about how we were going to evaluate something going, wow, like we're saying we're going to do this activity and it's going to lead to this outcome. I don't think we have a tight enough connection there. And I, I certainly don't want to evaluate, put a plan for evaluating that if we don't have a good plan in place. So that sort of iterative process of thinking about evaluation and thinking about how it relates to your plan, I think can really strengthen a design. It can help you identify some weaknesses in your plan. We tend to, we can be very optimistic when you're project, when we're planning a project and how, you know, it's all going to be so great if we do this. And I think the evaluation perspective really brings a reality check to it and can really strengthen it. And then, of course, you don't want to just, it's not just about the plan, right? This is about right. really carrying it through, uh, throughout the life of your project, using the evaluation as you go along to make improvements. Um, and as I think NSF likes to see that, like that we're, you know, we learned this through our evaluation, so we've made these types of adjustments to our project. And then, of course, as um, we were talking about earlier in the webinar, the um, results from prior support. I think it really comes, uh, you know, the importance of having evidence and data and to back up your claims about the great things you did with your prior grant, it really becomes apparent when you put that first thing in your next proposal and you want to, you know, make a case that you are, you know, as Tom talked about being a steward, you, you're a great steward of these resources and you can really make things happen with them, um, then the importance of evaluation really becomes apparent then if it hasn't already. Good points, Lori. Thanks for those comments. Let's turn back to Tom. Tom, I have two distinct questions for you. First has to do with this uh, title, Program Officer. So as I understand it, 
a proposal comes in and it's assigned to you or one of your colleagues and you then become the program officer and you'll actually communicate with the project at that stage. The communication will be between you and the project and therefore you are the program officer uh, that's assigned to your project. Does that sound right? Um, yes. So there are um, every grant proposal and every project that becomes funded has two points of contact at NSF. The first is someone like me who's a program officer or program director. Those two terms are interchangeable. Um, and we concentrate on the intellectual merit, broader impact aspects of a project. And we work with the PI to make sure that that is um, being, being um, addressed and fulfilled. So the program officer and the PI are direct contacts with one another. However, a grant is not given to an individual. A grant is given to an institution. So there's another contact, which is primarily a financial um, contact. And that contact is between our grants office, so that person is called a grants officer here at NSF, and the um, institution sponsored research office, somebody at the institution who is um, responsible for um, overseeing all of the grants and the other federal money that occurs. And so um, really, the person who should be communicating with the program officer, like me, is only the PI. Uh, we're a little fuzzy on that, um, depending on what's going on. But we never want it to seem like the program officer is having conversations that the PI is not involved in. Um, but things that are um, related to simply the financial transactions that are occurring within a project and are supported by the federal funds, we don't really get involved in that too much. Um, and so that conversation is between the institution sponsored research office and the NSF grants office who is, that's housed in our division of grants and agreements. They are the ones who actually make the award. Um, if you look at the review process, there's actually a couple of steps. There's the um, merit step, which looks at intellectual merit, broader impacts. That's driven by me. Um, I then make a recommendation, but the person who actually makes the decision is in the grants office, and they only make a decision, um, or a positive decision, if they're confident that the institution is capable of handling federal funds. So. Um, Another way to think about this, and this is very important for new PIs to know, is if you're preparing your proposal in Fastlane and you hit the submit button, that doesn't actually submit your grant proposal to NSF. That then just tells your sponsored research office that there's a grant application waiting to be submitted to NSF. And they're the ones who actually submit on behalf of the institution right there. So um, there's two pretty clearly defined channels of communication between the institution and the foundation. Good. Thank you, Tom. Um, just, I'm going to pause for a second. I got a message on the machine here that says, we're using the chat window so much we might be approaching the text limit. So folks, I can always open another chat window, the device tells me. So if that happens, I'll do that. But don't worry if anything happens to the chat. We've got that under control. Uh, well, Tom, back I'd, to you. I'd like to comment on something I saw yeah. in the chat window. Yeah, go, go ahead, Tom. Uh, somebody um, with, brought up a question with respect to the small new to ATE um, program. Um, the limitations on the small new to ATE program are only for institutions who have not had ATE funding in the last seven years. So if you've had IU's funding or STEM funding or funding from any other program at NSF, that does not eliminate you from coming in under the small new to ATE. Um, so our, our, we only um, restrict that to people who haven't had ATE funding within the last seven years. And that also, um, if you've been a subawardee on somebody else's ATE grant, that doesn't eliminate you as well. If you've only been, um, um, if you have not been the performing organization or the cognizant fiscal agent, which means you're the institution who the direct award was made to by the NSF, um, and you've just been a subawardee, you're still eligible to come in on small new to ATE as long as you fulfill um, all of those other things. So 
being supported by Mentor Connect, being supported by Mentor Links also does not count against you because those are NSF projects. They are not, they are funded by the NSF, but they're not administered by the NSF. Well, excellent. Thank you, uh, Tom, for that clarification. Now, there's another thing, and I might ask several of you to, to respond to this. Tom, as long as you're on the stand, we'll, we'll use you first. There's been a lot of action in the chat, a lot of questions about the difference between a letter of commitment and a letter of support. Let's think about it from the NSF perspective first. In your ideal letter that's attached from, let's say, a, a partner or industry member or somebody, what do you want to see? What are you looking for? Okay, so, so a letter of support is something that simply says, this project is great, these people are great, they deserve money. Like, that's a letter of support, that is not helpful, and that is not allowed, and letters like that um, could get your proposal returned without review. A letter of commitment is one that says, these are the things that I will do or my organization will do to ensure that this project is successful or to help the PI be successful. So letters of commitment are things that, that um, commit explicit resources such as um, time and insight and things like that in order to um, increase the chances that a project will be successful. Okay, good, excellent. Let's turn to OSA. OSA, I have a question for you that came up in, in the panel. Uh, should faculty who participate in Mentor Connect, um, should that be considered prior support? Do, what if a, a, you know, how would you respond to that question? I don't know if you saw that one there, OSA. I did, yes, and it's, it's not uh, prior support as such because the funding did not go to the person or the uh, college that's submitting the proposal. But uh, we've been told by the program officers time and again that it's a good idea to include that in the section on prior support. Uh, most of the people who apply uh, who are involved in Mentor Connect have not had any prior support at all, but they will say that they are involved in the Mentor Connect project and receiving mentoring towards submitting the proposal. Follow-up question. NSF uh, understand you know, where, where they're coming from and know that they're sure. involved with Mentor sure. Connect. A uh, follow-up question on that, it, you, if someone says, uh, you know, I don't have any prior support, I'm new to ATE, they just don't put anything there, right, Osa? You, you have to specify that uh, you have not had prior support. You cannot leave that blank. Okay, good. That's, that's a very good. important thing, yeah. Lori, let's um, turn to you. Here's a question. I'm sort of going to throw this one at you. You're advising, you're an evaluator, they've asked you for help in constructing their results of prior support um, section of the proposal. How do you advise them? Do you ask them to focus on activities, on outcomes? Uh, what do you say if, if, you, if you were asked that question? Um, well, I think it's good. You want to provide an overview or, of what the prior project was. Um, I have heard Celeste Carter, uh, the, one of the leads of the ATE program, on numerous occasions to say what she sees, much to her chagrin sometimes, is someone just copies and pastes from their prior proposal about what they had planned to do. So that's not how you don't want to, you know, think about that 15 pages, every little, you know, paragraph is valuable real estate. So you don't want to just waste that section on saying what you were funded to do. Give a, a short overview of, of what the project was. Um, I like to report on our, you know, our very tangible accomplishments. We served this many people. We held, you know, this many workshops, you, you know, factual stuff. But then to focus on the, you know, um, more compelling evidence of outcomes. How did you make a difference? What, how did you contribute to it, you know, advancing whatever it is you were addressing in your project? So I would prioritize um, more outcomes type evidence. I mean, you really want to put yourself in the perspective of what would be meaningful and convincing and compelling to a reviewer. Um, and just so put on that, um, you know, sort of, but they're looking at a lot of proposals, which can all may be very good. So you really want to make your stand out, show you what you did with your, your prior support and uh, focus on those higher level results. 
Good, good. Thanks for that response. Let's go to a logistics question. Back to Lissa. Lissa, um, often an evaluator evaluator's work involves a site visit to a project. How is that budgeted? Is that assumed to be part of that budget that you talked about? Was that you or Emma that was talking about budget? I'm sorry, I don't remember. But I'll start with you, Lissa. How do how is evaluator uh, travel handled? Evaluator travel, assuming it is after the grant, right? You're not talking about before yes. the proposal yes. is written. Yes. So after after the grant is awarded, should be included in that budgetary section. It should be justified. Um, I mean, we always suggest that a site visit is a really good idea. Um, is very helpful in many times for the evaluator and for the project staff. But you want to make sure that it's nothing out of control. Okay, Emma, that sound right? Yes, I feel like Lisa answered that very well. Okay, cool. All right, now we're going to have a little fun. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Tom Higgins. Tom, what's the worst evaluation section you've ever seen? What, what, when you read it, you said, how could they have actually written this thing? Please don't be specific about it. But what really struck you as something that you said, oh my god, how did they do this? Well, I would say, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, Tom. I would say um, we do see, not just in ATE, but all programs, um, evaluation sections that are very generic, full of buzzwords, and don't contain anything specific. Um, that's, that's one sort of um, very, very common, poorly uh, thought out evaluation section we see. And then another one has to do with it's very clear that whoever developed the evaluation um, doesn't know what's going on in the project, or whoever's putting together the project doesn't know what's going on in the evaluation because the two sections clearly don't go together and they don't make any sense. Um, and th my my guess is that that that's somebody who found somebody at the last minute who just copied and pasted did something into the evaluation section so there would be something there. So um, that, those are the two sort of common mistakes that we see with respect to evaluation. And those, those two states are very apparent when you see them, aren't they? Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and rare, rare, rare occasions when everything else in the proposal is close to perfect, we can work, with the, we can work those things out with the PI. But um, usually if those things are going on, you're dealing with somebody who's got uh, challenges in other areas as well. Thanks, Tom. Osa, to you, uh, I'm, I'm writing a new to ATE proposal. I'm actually not even sure about evaluation. I don't understand it very much. I mean, where, where do I look for help? How do you, how do you help a, a new to ATE project, or what would you advise a new to ATE project do to sort of get started? Should they contact an evaluator? Should they watch these webinars? What do you think? What's their best starting point? Oh, so you're still on mute. Hold on, folks. We'll just unmute you. Say, oh, so here in just a moment. Oh, so we're going to hold that question for you and uh, and work with your microphone in a minute. Let's turn now to Lori. Oh, there you are. Oh, so are you back? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, somehow that function was just absolutely stuck. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'm glad okay. you're back. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, was that uh, I would send people directly to the Evaluate website because I think that the resources that are listed there and the checklists are uh, just an absolutely perfect start to getting a sense for what evaluation needs to be all about. Good. I think that's a great comment. Lori, back to you. What have you seen that that maybe have struck you as bad or a story that you couldn't believe when it came to evaluation sections of proposal? Anything you would like to tell us for fun? Again, not being specific with anything. Sure. So we actually are conducting a study right now. So we have over a hundred 
um, randomly selected proposals since about 2004. I haven't personally looked at all those. Our external evaluator is, is analyzing those. But we, we did, in, in developing our, our plan for this, did look at quite a few. Um, and I, I wouldn't say I have a horror story, but I think a common mistake is that all the elements that we have, like that we outline in our evaluation plan checklist, most of the elements are there in a plan, but it's really not clear how they fit together. For example, um, they'll say our method is we're going to conduct surveys and focus groups and look at student data. And there's no relationship of what those data, there's no explanation of what those data are going to address in terms of the evaluation questions. It's, it's implicit and it's assumed. Um, and to really show you have a tight, well thought out um, plan, you know, that's why it's good to, what uh, Lisa was talking about is putting that in a matrix. Here's our question. These are the data we're going to look for. Here's how we're going to analyze it. So you really show you have a clear plan for answering those evaluation questions. And it's not, when you just list out some methods you're going to use, it, it's, it's quite unclear if you're actually going to be able to answer your evaluation questions. Um, so that's, that's one um, common thing. I think another common thing which you know, I think some people are more tuned into than others in terms of reviewers is a lot of people just assume uh, the evaluation is about assessing if your goals were achieved. And that's absolutely important, but sometimes um, goals were really focused on the doing of the project. We're going to develop a curriculum, we're going to hold six workshops, we're going to do these presentations. And so if you focus your evaluation only on uh, goal achievement, um, it's really just it's really just checking boxes, and you really don't need an external evaluator, a robust evaluation plan. It's just documentation that you did the things, and that's really falling short of what NSF is looking for for evaluation. It's cutting short the potential of evaluation to really serve the interests of your project to to produce evidence that you can use to make improvements as you're going along. So those are two big things I think are really common. They're easy to fall into, but you want to avoid to have a really strong evaluation plan. Good comments, Lori. As we wind up today, let's turn back to Tom. Tom, you mentioned this before, but I wanted to bring it up because I always found it amazing. You will actually respond to someone who asks you questions during the proposal development process, won't you? We, yes, we try to. We try to. Um, if you do want a good um, answer from a program officer, though, don't use the telephone. Use email. Um, you can imagine the volume of calls that we get and um, all of the other things that we're, we have to do. So you're going to get the highest quality answer from us if you contact us by email and if a conversation is necessary, we set up a time where, and that uh, we can chat for 15 or 20 minutes. So it could be you or one of the other program officers in ATE. I mean, how do we start? Suppose we're writing one of these new ATE proposals. We have a question. I'm not sure whose email to use. Um, yeah, for the for the small new to ATE, it's right now. I'm I'm the lead on that. So you yes. can use use my contact information. You can find it up near the top of the ATE project um, homepage. Um, I'm a co-lead of ATE along with Heather Watson, which uh, basically means Celeste is the general and we're her, we're her two lieutenants. Um, but also, if you look on the uh, home page, you'll see that the um, ATE is broken down by discipline as well. And so even if you're working on a small new to ATE, it may be a good idea to reach out to the program officer who is in your discipline. Um, and talk to him or her, especially if you're trying to figure out what else might be going on that is relevant to um, the area that you're working in. Um, now, one thing program officers don't like is we don't like to be contacted piecemeal. Um, so if you're going to contact, if you're, let's say you're working in information technology sure. um, and you're working on a small new, uh, well, Stephanie August is our resident expert in IT, so you should email her and you should email me together. So yes. we know that you're contacting both of us, so one of us doesn't duplicate what the other one is doing. That's um, an important thing. But that that's the best way to decide who to make first contact with. Great, Tom. We really appreciate the responsiveness of you and your colleagues. I think that's not common at all across federal agencies to have a program officer be so responsive. So thank you.
Osa, question for you. It's too late to join the Mentor Connect cohort for this year. How do I do it for next year? When does that happen? Well, that is happening now. Uh, applications are available on our website. Just go to mentorconnect.org and you will find us. And they, they will be open now until into the fall. Good, and thank you for your participation today, Osa. Laurie, we're going to give you the last words here. You mentioned you've collected a series of evaluation plans over the years. Have you seen things getting better? Are they getting better because of Evaluate's webinars? <laughs> well, that's what we hope to see. Um, we haven't seen the yes. results of that study yet. Our uh, team from our external evaluation group is looking at that, so that it's completely independent of us. But that's absolutely what we want to see. There's no guarantees, and there's lots of things that influence evaluation. So stay tuned for those sure. results. Thank you, Lori. Tom, Oza, Lori, thank you very much for joining the panel today. Listen, Emma, just an excellent presentation. We really appreciate uh, all the work that you did in making this happen today. So thank you. Let me remind you that today's materials are uh, available from the middle right of the screen or from evaluate.org slash webinars slash August 19. You can see them there. Everything is there. So don't hesitate to do that. The recording will be up in a couple of days. And finally, as we conclude the end of this webinar, you can imagine how important it is to have you complete our survey. So I'm launching that survey now. This survey is going to come up on your screen. Some older Macs might not show the survey. If the survey, which is now up on our test machines, does not appear for you, you can use the survey link in the chat window. So speaking for myself and my, my fellow panelists and our presenters for today, thanks for joining uh, our Evaluate the secret sauce. So hopefully this will help you prepare for not only your upcoming October proposal, but your future proposals as well. Thank you, everyone. This officially ends our webinar. Please complete our, um, our survey that's up on the screen, and we'll see you at the next Evaluate webinar. Goodbye.